All right, uh, can you all hear me? Great, uh, next we're gonna talk about um, fitting and benchmarking uh, condensed phase properties. Uh, we heard a lot about quantum chemistry already this morning and how we're gonna use that information for parameterizing valence uh, terms. But for now, let me share this. Uh, after I go back to sharing. We're gonna talk about how we compute some of the condensed phase properties. Um, we had a breakout session yesterday afternoon where we uh, overviewed some of these concepts, um, but we also wanted to get a little bit into the science here. Um, and Michael Schertz is going to come up uh, to prevent the, present the next few slides. All right, so um, this is a large effort uh, where many people are involved in uh, different aspects of this with the idea that we're building a common infrastructure that we can then all plug in different or, and explore different ideas of what kinds of condensed phase data we want to use for assessing the quality of the force fields, as well as actually uh, fitting parameters. Um, you know, what, one of the main motivating factors is that uh, our first effort here is ignoring polarizability. We're building fixed charge force fields where we know that we have to build the effects in in some average way. Um, and you know, even if we did have polarizability, there's other things we might have to kind of include from condensed phase data uh, in order to get high accuracy because we're still missing things like nuclear quantum effects or other things people think are important. Um, let me just give this to you in case there's a question during the. All right, uh, so we, the properties that we care most are often very difficult to compute directly, like binding affinities for complex protein ligand systems. And so our goal is to find condensed phase data that informs the parameterization of force fields, um, but it's still very easy to compute uh, both for fitting and uh, for benchmarking. Um, uh, there's uh, an interest in getting good quality um, protein ligand data, and we'll talk a bit more about that in the afternoon perhaps, uh, for benchmarking and assessment. Um, and then maybe there's also possibilities for using things like host guest uh, affinities, which are much more rapid to compute, uh, but like protein ligand data uh, for the, the parameterization. Um, but right now we're focusing on properties of organic liquids because that's been traditionally used with great success. Uh, and there's an abundance of this data. It's all free um, and it is in a structured format that allows computers and, and humans to read it. There's lots of different kinds of experimental data we can in principle access that's reasonably easy to get to. Some of it is a little bit harder or a little bit less clear about how we would get open data sets, uh, but we're still looking into those as well. Um, the different kinds of data that we look at inform, inform different classes of parameters uh, or different classes of, of the interaction potential uh, in different ways. Um, and we're, we're really working on trying to prioritize how we tackle these, but still make it possible for different researchers to independently explore how to bring these different data sources into our parameterization scheme. And then have, how to make sure it's uh, modular enough that uh, even though they're developed independently, when we bring them together, everything can, be, can work together for joint parameterization. Um, we found in the past that benchmarking against condensed phase data can identify systematic issues. Um, as was brought up uh, the other day, um, uh, I can share the pointer. Um, there are some systematic issues, for example, with some of the liquids uh, being displaced in densities, for example. And this is, these are things that we can look into uh, about whether there might be some systematic parameter issues or some other data sources we can use to improve things. This was just the Smirnoff 99 Frost unoptimized uh, parameter set. Uh, there's also this issue of this being water, uh, and we're probably not going to use Smirnoff water to begin with, but it's something that at least you can see that there's a, a clear, it's a clear outlier and that it deserves some attention. Uh, we also identified other systematic issues with dielectric constants where our, uh, these are um, uh, inverse dielectric constants which highlight the way in which this in introduces an error into the interaction energies of different, uh, different molecules. And you can see that certain force fields have, um, like Smirnoff, have very poor uh, reproduction at very low dielectrics, which may cause some problems in reproducing things like uh, transfer for energies into uh, low dielectric media. Um, this is something, again, we can improve by using some dielectric data to improve our force fields. Um, we'd also computed things like hydration free energies. Their utility for condensed phase properties is still uncertain because of the fact that they don't reflect the, uh, or they contain a, something that we don't include, which is the polarization con contribution from going from gas phase to water phase. But it's still useful to be able to benchmark them reproducibly and reliably. Um, there's some really exciting stuff that's going on in Mike Gilson's group with uh, being able to use uh, host guest systems which and make lots of derivatives of these that could inform things like amino acid-like interactions with 
small molecules that very much resemble drugs. Um, and we're getting to, be, getting to the point where we can compute those more and more reliably and more and more rapidly. So those could be used in benchmarking and then fitting of force fields as well. And uh, are possibly uh, very useful in, in decoding different failures um, and then hopefully fixing them by identifying the right data sets to include. So uh, we thought that Leonard Jones parameters haven't been revisited in quite some time and, and certainly merit um, uh, an opportunity for improving the accuracy if co-optimized with everything else. Um, and uh, there's you know, sort of a little bit of a history about when these things were last modified. A lot of them haven't been touched in some time. There's a really cool, very recent effort in 2018 where uh, Charms, uh, Mount Alex Mackerel and uh, Benoit Roux have uh, reparameterized a lot of small molecules using a, a set of um, uh, neat liquid data. Um, the, they, we still haven't seen how that is reflected in predicting, or how that changes prediction accuracy because it was done independently of the other terms. Um, but it'll be interesting to see uh, how that evolves for them as well. And they only used densities and heaps of vaporization of pure fluids. And there are so much data on mixtures that reflects how different kinds of functional group moieties interact uh, that it seems silly not to use, make use of that. So that's something we would very much like to use, make use of. And it's not just binary mixtures, there's ternary mixtures, there's lots of classes of data that we could explore. So this is, was, uh, a lot of you have seen this before, this was sort of our attempt to figure out what's the easiest thing to do that will give us the biggest win first. We've heard a lot about uh, reparameterizing the valence terms and the uh, refitting the torsions or coming up with new valence types. And we think early on this is uh, very big improvements uh, from using Leonard Jones uh, or liquid data that informs the improvement of Leonard Jones parameters and then uh, getting into things like the host guest thermodynamics. And then later on, we're thinking more about possibly reparameterizing everything. For, for our initial sprint here for small molecules, we're trying to uh, keep compatibility with the Leonard Jones parameters of biopolymers without having to change those. And there's some discussion maybe that'll happen in the afternoon about how best to do that, how best to preserve compatibility uh, with protein parameters from Ember. Um, so what we're, we're trying to do is, as we've heard in the software discussion, is, is uh, come up with a, a design that really allows this effort to grow and scale um, and to allow independent researchers to, to do their research somewhat independently and then plug their the, the fruits of their efforts into this modular framework that will allow us to use everything together uh, in a synergistic way. So a lot of the focus has been on uh, careful design and coming up with plug-in architectures through clear APIs uh, and clear standards for documenting how we compute things is also going to be integral when we, uh, because there's many ways to compute every kind of physical property. We'd like to pick the best way, very efficient, uh, something that doesn't have systematic biases in it, if at all possible, document that and make sure uh, everybody agrees that this is sort of the best practice for the field. And there's other ways we can disseminate that information besides just documentation as well. There are cool things like the Living Journal of Computational Molecular Sciences that uh, Michael and David uh, have, have uh, co-founded uh, where we can report and continue to evolve our, our reporting of, of what we think the best way to do things is. Um, we'd like to have a, a life cycle that I'll tell you a bit more about in uh, the next slide about how we first use things for benchmarking and once we've got them to be fast enough, we can potentially use them for parameterization. And the, again, the way we're, we're pulling all this together is there's basically three different levels of API. If you uh, want to do your own benchmarking, you'd be using this property calculation API where you ask it for some properties uh, given uh, a set of experimental data and it'll tell you how wrong it is or how right it is. Um, we have an API that allows us to develop new properties that, and uh, by defining some code that plugs in independently into this property plugin API and we'll be working on ways uh, which we can have different surrogate models speed up our, our parameterization of these force fields. So we'll internally be dealing with all three of these uh, and but we're trying to standardize them one, two, and three as time goes on so that we can uh, we can um, modularize our efforts. Uh, this is how, for example, you'd use the public API. This is just a, a, an example of what this might look like from the outside. You'd start with uh, defining a data set. And we're, we're using this ThermoML archive, which is a NIST uh, uh, archive of lots of data that has been published in thermophysical property journals that is reflected in an IU, IUPAC standard XML format. Uh, so it's a, a very standard format where the data is captured directly along with its uncertainty, its provenance, uh, the exact specifications of what kind of system and thermodynamic conditions. There are journal site keys that go along with this and might specify a data set. So you could, we could curate these uh, ourselves or we could come up with uh, 
other sources of, of these or, or URLs that you could pull from. So you can create something like, like a data set object which knows how to interpret all the data from that data source. Uh, by going to the Thermo ML archive, you can filter it based upon things that we want to actually compute, like the excess molar enthalpy, um, and you can then filter it subsequently by uh, temperatures or pressures uh, to get down to a data set that's going to be relevant for our, our different uh, uh, uses for other utility um, in dealing with chemical reactors at weird temperatures or pressures, or if you're dealing with surfactants, you might filter this data set entirely differently, which is why we also want to make this uh, reproducible for, for you to do at home. Uh, and then we can, we can take our parameter set and uh, create a property estimator which knows how to do connect to the open force field cloud, for example, and ask it for the properties of this data set uh, given the parameters. And then we can look at uh, how the measured values and how the, um, how the uh, computed values actually might differ. So we in intend this to be very simple to use, even though it's hiding a lot of stuff that can be going on on the back end, which is a continually improving, efficient way of computing all of these properties. So when, you come up with it, when we come up with a new physical property we might want to include, we'd first define an object model that represents what it is that the property measures uh, and uh, how to get it from a source database like ThermoML or the binding DB, for example, if we're using host guest data. We then curate some data we think we might be interested in using for benchmarking and then later fitting. We develop a forward simulation model which says, if I run a molecular simulation, how do I compute a property like a density or an enthalpy or a static dielectric constant? then we would uh, document those best practices uh, so that we know exactly what the code is doing um, and that other researchers can check this. Uh, we develop an error likelihood model which says, given the experimental errors, if it's a property that has to be measured through multiple different measurements, how, does that, how, does, how do my deviations from that reflect uh, differences in, in how likely uh, my actual parameters are reproducing the right experimental data? Then we sort of integrate this into the benchmarking uh, epoch for the next generation by plugging it into our infrastructure to see how well we're actually doing at all these different properties. And finally, after we've optimized it enough, we can uh, include it in parameterization and keep adding more data to this to keep increasing the accuracy of these force fields. Um, so uh, I think uh, now I want to turn it over to Michael, who has much more to say about our roadmap for this. And uh, let's see. Cool. So just a little bit about, you know, so roadmap of which pro physical properties to use when. Um, backing up a little bit, we know that all the thermodynamics is determined by the Gibbs free energy, which is explicitly a function of temperature, pressure, and composition, and nothing else. So on a theoretical basis, if we have, um, if we have enough, temp uh, enough uh, data that gives us the free energy as a function of temperature, pressure, and composition, we'll get all the thermodynamics right. And most of the thermodynamics observables we get are actually derivative properties or second derivative properties of that free energy. Um, it won't always tell us why we get the thermodynamics right. So there are some other things we can measure that are not just derivative properties of free energy. Like for example, st static dielectrics give the change, uh, express things to do with the change of free energy with respect to an external electric field, which provides additional information about electrostatic energy terms. So, um, we want to be thinking about things into what information does it give us uh, when we look at these properties. But we also need to balance uh, availability of experimental data. Some experimental data is available, some isn't. Information content of experimental data. Uh, ease of producing or obtaining new experimental data for cases where the chemical coverage is not good for existing data. And simulation expense. Some of these involve uh, one five nanosecond simulation of 2,000 molecules. Some of them involve free energy calculations that take hundreds of nanoseconds. Um, and so in, in some cases, we will want to generate new data for parts of chemical space that don't have enough information. This is pretty clear now. We can get decent coverage, but there's going to be uh, spaces, uh, there's going to be functionalities that we don't have enough data for already. Um, so so low-hanging fruit, um, molar volumes and densities, which are response functions, free energy, uh, with res derivative of free energy with respect to pressure, is the molar volume. So that gives us that information. Static dielectrics give us the response of uh, free energy to change in electric field. Um, temperature dependence of the above. If we can get temperature dependence of those properties, then we start getting temperature uh, dependence as well. Um, one thing that's problematic but might be useful at first is enthalpies of vaporization, hydration for energies, and enthalpy. So why do I say they're problematic? One thing we want to do, if we want to get liquid phase properties right, we want to avoid, to the extent possible, that we're dealing with things that involve phase transfer, especially if we're dealing with 
non-polarizable models. It's not a horrible job to do that thing to do that because we know that most current force fields use uh, this information uh, and are not that bad. But it's the, uh, you know one, uh, something, and perhaps the science thing we can look at is to understand what uh, what how much error that introduces. Uh, why do why would we why can we just uh, ignore that entirely? Uh, because enthalpies. Uh, provide temperature dependence information on the free energy. In order to get the thermodynamics right, we do need to have temperature dependence there. So something, uh, we need, in order to really constrain uh, the properties, in order to constrain the properties, we need to have some sort of temperature dependence. Paul was very, <laughs> wanted to say something. Um, uh, just with the static dielectrics, I was struck <laughs> by um, uh, over and over the graph that was in uh, the paper from John, and I think you authored maybe uh, uh, the inverse static dielectric constants so we know that like um, something that's purely like as nonpolar as possible yes like hexane where um, mm. have static dielectric constants that are about two yes but a fixed charge model will always predict that they're one correct uh, yes so is that actually a good property to go after or there's ad hoc uh, mm. post hoc um, corrections mm. one can make, and those were made in the mayor. But um, to me, that is of the flavor of the post hoc corrections made for polarization energy. Mm. And um, obviously, for a very polar liquid, that's less of a problem. Right. Static yeah. dielectric will be mostly determined by that. But I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts about that, or maybe it's better for the breakout after. Yeah. So, so, fundamentally, if you want to get the thermodynamics right, getting the static dielectric is not actually necessary. Um, so I, I, th I think it's the idea is that we, we need a little more information than density. We can't just fit to the densities. And so this is, so, so I agree that, that you know, the long run that might not be, you know, once we get enough good coverage with enough of other properties and can show that other things constrain it sufficiently, that might be something that we don't want to include in the fit. So we do also know that like there's clear gain to be had by including dialect yes. constants like yeah. the alcohol data I showed. Mm -hmm. So so you, you might not necessarily expect that it would be a great property to fit it to, but it does clearly help if we do. So maybe, so we'll have to see how far that goes. Because it, it gets some things right by getting the, ch the change of the fringe with respect to the electrostatics. Right? So it's a, it's a good signal if the electrostatics are badly wrong. But maybe it's something we need to think about, some sort of priors on it, that if the dielectric is less than a certain amount, then we neglect uh, the, the dielectric. We just we turn it off as the dielectric goes below 10 or something. Yeah, we turn off the dependence, yeah. Which Bayesian inference can, you know, we can stick the priors on that help us do that. Just one comment about the enthalpies of vaporization. I agree with the point you made, but if we, to the extent that we do include it, I think that you're on, at any rate, relatively safer ground if you don't have flexible molecules. Because what you don't want is a molecule that is open in, the, in water and then forms an internal hydrogen right. bond in the right. gas. Yes. It's rigid then. There's a polarization right. problem, but not the conformation. Right, and this is why I'm saying we might be useful at first. I th in order to actually constrain the parameters, we might need to include even flawed temperature, you know, the, the energetic data, which provides the temperature response to free energy that is required to get your, you know, the, free, the, the full Gibbs free energy. Um, okay, so of course we talk, we've talked about volume dependence and temperature dependence, but there's also, very importantly, composition dependence. Uh, and some things that are nearly as low-hanging are density and dielectric for mixtures. Um, the, uh, the partial molar volumes, which is essentially the difference between ideality and the actual volume of a solution, can provide a lot of information about the pairwise interactions. Um, di there's a lot of dielectric information for mixtures, and, and looking at variation might be uh, fruitful. Uh, compressibility, thermal expansion, speed of sound are second derivative properties that uh, you know people that have been working on simpler systems like refrigerants and alk you know, alkanes, uh, fossil fuels have discovered that you can get a lot of information out. You, 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 if you include this, there's a lot of experimental data there and it can get you a, a lot if you can include that as well. It's at the speed of sound, there's a lot, it's a surprising amount of data, a literature data, and um, it, it turns out that it ends up frequently being a canary in the coal mine for force fields, that if, if speed of sound goes wrong before any, anything else, uh, when parameters start to drift. Um, partial molar volumes, heats of mixing, residual heat capacity. So these are all things that are, uh, there's a fair amount of data on and are very easy to do simulations for. Instead of just one simulation, you need N plus two simulations where N is the number of compositions you look at. And so, um, Heats of, and the nice thing about heats of mixing is there you start getting temperature dependent data 
that you don't have to worry about phase behavior. You just look at what's the enthalpy as I go um, from two pure fluids and then I mix those fluids. And those, uh, those things, then, then a lot of it, the, the, your reference state is no longer the vapor, your reference state is the pure fluid. So that's uh, something where we start tying much more directly to exactly what we want to be measuring, which are things like drug binding affinities. Um, so those are pretty low hanging and, and in many cases, there's a lot of good data on these. Uh, more computationally expensive, the probe intramolecular energies, partition coefficients, infinite dilution activity coefficients, which you know, is again, these are, we're essentially getting at um, what, how does the free energy change with the function of composition, relative solubilities, all these require free energy calculation, but for small molecules, they're not, you know, we're, we're talking when, an order of magnitude more computational power. Uh, these are things that, that NIST has a lot of these uh, data for, they're less well curated than some of the others. Uh, but but something that that are are you know things that if we we know how to do and we can include them um, more complex but closer even more complex closer to what we want to predict host gas binding free energies with chemically tuned hosts and guests to get at chemical interactions we're particularly interested in and Mike Gelson uh, has has done and his group have done a lot of work in this ligand binding free energy calculations that we are confident can converge now this is sort of the this is what we want to be doing, right? We, we want to get that right, but it's not going to be something we are going to include in uh, parameterization in the near term because it sort of hits all the bad things. It's very expensive to do. We're not sure we can do it. And the experiments, uh, unless they're carried out under very careful conditions, can be problematic in, in interpreting them as well. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, so do you mind describing just quickly how the parameters get fit to all of these? Like what's a basic schema for, like I get how you fit torsions and angles, but like how does all of this get, fit? like how do the parameters get fit to all of these? So uh, maybe be, be, be a little more precise. I, 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 I want to... So, say you have your force field and yes. you want to optimize the parameters yes. and you want it to be optimal to all of the valence properties that have already yes. been described. Then you're like, oh, I want the densities right too. Mm -hmm. Mixtures. So how does that happen in so practice? Why don't you go? Yesterday, uh, Li Ping talked about different. You have so it's different like force balance. It's, so it would, the initial phase is going to be use, using force balance, where the objectives are targets that uh, Li Ping has defined, which treat the air, have different error models. So there's a, a penalty for deviations from densities. There's a weight that controls how much you weight different classes of of these targets. Uh, and I'm sure Leaping can talk about it in much more sophisticated ways. In the Bayesian epoch of this, then we're thinking of using a likelihood function. Both of those, you need some quantification of the experimental error because you want to weight thing, deviations that are really important, okay. more or less than others. That's what I thought. I just needed it all put yep. together yes. for me again today. So it's either contributing to this error penalty function that's also regularized in a force balance, or it's contributing to likelihood functions in the Bayesian epoch. Thank you. Um, okay, so the others, I think there's some other thing. Oh, yes. Uh, yeah, I got a quick question. Uh, could you comment on the quality of the experimental data you are using? So are all data that's curated? Uh, right, so good question. So a lot of the, the data that's... Arrow bars. Yeah, so the data that's in Thermo ML, um, it's curated in two ways. One way is they just suck up everything in the journals and put it in there. But for especially the pure data, I have to check on the mixture data. They run another set of in-house air analysis where they actually fit the data to a thermodynamic model and see if it's all self-consistent and also if it's consistent with thermodynamics. In other words, your heat capacity is at different temperatures and your enthalpies uh, of vaporization, different, they have to be related. If they're not related, something's wrong. So there's both self-consistency within the data and thermodynamic consistency. For the mixtures, I'm not as clear what their internal data models, uh, what their data models are. And it, it's complicated that these data models are not open. It has to do with how the Department of Commerce's charter is complicated. But but point is that they're on board and they're going to be helping us look at the data and make sure and, and make sure that we're not using. So they have their what. Besides the paper published error bars, they have their error bars as well from their internal uncertainty models that are essentially always larger. Uh, we're probably going to be using those and we're going to be working with them to make sure when we bring the data in, we're bringing in data that has been, they've, they've been looking at and, and have some, and, and can, ex, can tell us a little more about what's going on there. Um, 
I, unfortunately, they can't be here because of the shutdown. So <laughs> um, I was hoping that you know they could say more about that. But anyway, yeah. Um, uh, but that deserves a whole talk in and of itself. Uh, so others, uh, there's other things that are going to be hard to fit to uh, because of lack of open data sources, but you know, are things that we could put in here as, as benchmarks that maybe would never be part of the parameter editions, but could be put in as ben benchmarks. Small molecule crystal structures, you don't want it to screw it up too badly. Um, like, you know, there's a number of other things that were floated yesterday as benchmarks, but, but might not match all the criteria for things we actually want to parameterize to. Um, so we're going to draw and uh, develop high quality data sets. So we want high quality computer readable data sets. This is important with those experimental uncertainties. Also very important in order to do any of the, in order to know how much we should wait in the fitting and unambiguous definitions of systems. So the NIST thermal ML, ML archive, uh, is, I've talked a little bit about for all the liquid data, binding database, uh, database, uh, subsets, uh, free solve for, uh, free uh, hydration, free energies. Uh, partition coefficients, relative solubilities, activity coefficients. Um, can industry provide some data since it can be made public? And the important thing is NIST can archive it uh, for almost all these things that NIST can, uh, can, can provide uh, essentially doing what they do with the, the journal data. So, so it's out there and, and can be put in thermo and L, ML and can be read. Uh, so so like a liquid thermodynamic data, looking at it a little bit. So NIST Thermo ML Archive, we can do some sorting through this. And what we see is that there's a lot of data, usually for any given, uh, comp uh, for any given uh, set of mixtures, there's a lot of temperature, pressure, and composition data. Usually most experiments do, you know, m most papers that they take this from run a lot of experiments. What atmosphere and biological temperature ranges and uh, chemical coverage is somewhat sparse. So ALK FLH is, is sort of a, a molecule, a limited, parameter molecule data set that just has alkanes, um, um, uh, then F OH, e ether, ethers, and then L alcohols. Um, and you can see some of the sort of interesting what there is here. So um, it's interesting, there's a lot of density data, a lot of speed of sound data, some dielectric constant data, heat capacities, enthalpy vaporizations are uh, moderately well represented. A uh, binary, there's as much binary data as there is um, as there's pure data, um, densities, speeds of sounds, dielectric constants, excess molar enthalpies, uh, excess molar heat capacities, uh, excess molar volume, there's decent amounts, uh, binary activity coefficients. So there's, there's a lot of data there that can be drawn from that has a lot more information content, I think, than just pure properties. Um, how are you... Uh planning on handling ionizable species uh, in, in this? Great question. This is something we've been talking about. And uh, how do we deal with like changes upon ionization and mixing, things like that? Mm -hmm. So you say you have even a pure liquid that has a uh, involves a carboxylic acid or a zwitter ion even yeah. or something like that. Um, I could imagine the, you know, when, when you're calculating the thermodynamic quantities out of that, you, you might have some mixture of ionization states. Right, right. So um, that's a great, I mean, I would imagine that what we need to do is we need to be doing some quality control putting in the making sure that we're running simulations where the protonation state is relatively unambiguous. But maybe Mike is, well, I just, I mean, I think, that's this thing working. That, uh, I mean, I think there is an issue because your typical pure liquid data will not be for ionized species. That would be an ionic liquid, which is another whole field, which may be worth looking at, actually. But like acids, uh, acid and water. That's oh, in water, yeah, yes. In, not, I, I mean, pure, yeah, it would be mixed, yeah, mixture, ionic. sorry, yeah, like mixture data and stuff like that. Yeah. yeah. Right, you add some, uh, I mean, I, and, and I guess the complication of it, I think, is that you want to do this all in an automated no, that's way, but that seems like that's going to take some potentially some manual curation. So we, we've been also looking into these ionizable species uh, as part of the you know log D challenges for sample um, and measuring PKAs for a bunch of different compounds, and then also measuring log Ds and log Ps separately, having people predict various things. So I, I think there's going to be a, a, a very uh, fruitful route by looking at 
octanol water partitioning data for species where we can get good PKA measurements experimentally as well. So there are P uh, constant pH simulation methods that we and others like Benoit Roux have been developing that will allow us to compute these properties for the full mixture of, of ionizable species. Otherwise, if you just have the experimental PKAs and you only know that there's like either fully ionized or not fully ionized, like one molecule in water, you can also um, uh, compute run two different simulations, then combine the data after the fact. So there's a bunch of different strategies, but I think the near-term strategy is just all just avoid. <laughs> avoid anything that's anything close to the PKAs. I, I, I mean, you, we, we put, together, uh, put together perfect roughly, you just pull it down from thermo NL, but I think at, for the you know, near and medium-term future, there's going to have to be some human creation just to make sure, do I really want that data? Not just about, do I trust the uncertainties, but is it is the composition well defined that exactly gets to that and we're not going to be able to automatically determine is the composition well defined but you know without human intervention at, for a long time so and i imagine this will be true of like a, a totemer species as well yeah i i think that especially you know for for, for a lot of the, the goal is if you're trying to parameterize by atom type and by, or not atom types or by chemical environment then you want to, you're going to want to try to do as much as possible at the beginning the simplest species possible where it's usually possible to figure out you know we know what it should be um, but yeah that's going to be a, a problematic when you know when expanding the data set um, so I, I think that's definitely something that is it has come up in our conversations before but it is good to be reminded by it, of it again <laughs> so it gets explicitly stated um, yeah, so eventually need more. So, so even looking at this, this is, this is a lot of data, but it's not, the, the coverage is not great. Uh, this is a, a heavily focused on things like alcohols, alkanes, not that many nitrogen containing species, very few sulfur containing species. And so uh, we know we're going to need to gather more experimental data to cover chemical space. Um, NIST and uh, Kadera Lab, they've been working on ways to automate, potentially automate experiments to, in order to generate things that are relatively cheap, like densities, it's a function of composition, heats of mixing. These uh, can be done in a controlled way and, and then you know, pipe that data into thermo ML and, and, and start using it. But that, um, the first year, maybe even, the, we definitely won't be doing that. We'll be working on existing data sets and seeing what we can do from there. Questions, huh? good questions here. Okay, um, computing physical properties is expensive. So, so one topic, this will take a little less time since it's more uh, just presenting, there's, there's, there's not as many, uh, it's a little more cut and dried than, um, than uh, which data to choose, which involves a lot of thinking about it. So computing physical properties is expensive. Even if we are doing a simulation just to calculate a density, yeah, for one molecule, easy. But what about doing a parameter scan on that? Uh, evaluating the least squares error penalty or data hot likelihood for each trial parameter set requires computing either expectation or uh, which is uh, which takes you know an hour I, mean, I don't know minimum ten minutes thirty minutes on a GPU if, if you're doing that over you know hundreds of thousands of parameters that's really hard to do or a free energy which takes about an order of magnitude more but both are expensive and importantly have statistical error so we need a hierarchy of schemes to evaluate the likelihood. Uh, even for multi, even for multi-dimensional optimization. So what we want to come up with is a, is a strategy where more more expensive levels, that is, doing a simulation, are only used as needed, such that the inference cost is amortized over all of those uh, measurements. And then when converged, then remaining evaluation, you, you do you always want to be doing at the end a couple more simulations at that data point, so you have confidence. But you want to be not doing your um, evaluation on the actual simulation, but some well-characterized model of the simulation. Um, so in the, the way we're, we're thinking of doing, uh, we, we've started doing this together is, you know, our most expensive level, the, the true thing is doing a molecular simulation at a parameter set. Uh, using reweighting, using M, uh, M bar formalism to estimate new properties at different parameters that are nearby. And then finally using some sort of fast surrogate model, a Gaussian process neural network trained on the next lowest level uh, or train of the previous lowest levels in order, and then doing optimization on that. Um, and we want it to be a way of fitting with uncertainty characterization so we have a, a sense of knowing when we've gone beyond the bounds and can perform more simulations there. So um, let me, so yeah, so this is the idea, I mean, it's the most expensive reweighting bar, surrogate, and then using surrogate models where you, you originally start in some region, 
uh, far, far from equilibrium in the parameter space. It's, it's, it's in equilibrium in the simulation space, but it might not be uh, ideal parameters. It wanders out of your trust region, uh, and then you'd run another simulation, generate uh, a new MBAR uh, surface, explore in that area until you leave your trust region of that expanded area. And the, the advantage of MBAR over sort of like typical standard, you know, one step perturbation is that you can use all of the data you've generated so far. All the, all the simulation data, different parameters can be combined together to create uh, expectations uh, at new parameters to use all of that data. Uh, and you continue until you get to a point where you start to converge. And at that point, you've got, uh, you know, you, you can run a few more simulations until you've lowered, uh, you've got much lower confidence interval on your properties, uh, and you're essentially your surrogate model matches your simulations to within, um, within precision. Questions on this? I say three here. We could, in principle, use more levels. It's not clear we'll need it, but the goal is to design the, the, uh, the, the algorithm such that they can handle an additional level if needed. Okay, so it gives you preliminary data for how uh, we put this together. So reweighting is cheap and can be made arbitrarily good. Let me say what I, uh, say what I mean by that. So reweighting to one state, um, probably most people have seen this, but I'll, I'll, um, I want to just make everything as clear as I can. So if you have A is some observable, you have the expectation at some state I. In this case, we'll generally be dealing with different parameters. So that's one particular parameter set. I want averages with parameter set I. Uh, what I can do is I can calculate, I can generate data from uh, simulation state J if I reweight each of them by this factor. And this factor is just, um, uh, this is just, uh, the Boltzmann, the normalized Boltzmann distribution. Oh, there's no way to, how do we go back? Anyway, I won't touch it so that it uh, won't keep auto advancing. Uh, right, so e to the beta, free energy minus beta, um, change in, in free energy from state one to state two, minus beta change in potential and energy of that configuration from state one to state two. That is just the Boltzmann weight. And I've, I, all I've done is I've taken the, um, the partition function at the bottom and just move it up to the top. So this is a normalized probability. So all I'm doing is essentially re-weighting re that observation with a normal, with a difference in probability of how probable that would be in state one versus how, uh, state I versus how probable it would be in state J. So uh, samples that are very like things you'd already see get in high, in I get high weights. Things that are unlike what you would see get low weights. So it essentially is a filtered average, the weighted average that says, I'm going to keep, I, I can tell by the basic laws of thermodynamics if this is something that I would see in parameter I, set parameter, uh, in parameter set I or not. If I would see it, great, I'll include it in my average. If not, I won't include it with a weight corresponding to the probability. So that's what we're doing. It's, it's we, when we uh, run simulations, a lot of those configurations would also be seen at similar parameter sets. Uh, and the free energy we can use, uh, we essentially, with the same data, we can estimate what that free energy difference would be as well. Uh, and with MBAR formalism, the, the, the uncertainties are, are, are uh, you can get uncertainties out of this, they're well controlled, or you can use bootstrap, which works even slightly better. Um, okay, but the problem is you get poor convergence if your difference in potential energy from one state to the next state varies too much. In other words, you have poor phase state overlap. You don't have any configurations in your sample from parameters at J that you would see in I. Uh, so the solution is to await to multiple states. So one way of writing this is, um, okay, so now my properties at state I are equal to a weighted ensemble of, uh, now what I have here is I, I've run several simulations. Uh, at several states, one, two, and three. And if I'm interested in a particular state I, then uh, the uh, numerator here is the, prob the Boltzmann probability of that state. The denominator is the sum of the Boltzmann, uh, sum of the probabilities from each of the other states I'm interested in. Uh, and then what I do is I average it over the mixture distribution. In other words, I just average it over all the samples I collected from all the simulations. And so what you're essentially saying, you've collected simulations at a bunch of different parameter states. This weighting allows you to say, ah, this particular configuration, would I see it in parameter state I? Yes, each of my individual samples will contribute a little to that average, and they'll contribute to that average according to, to how likely they would be in, in my particular, uh, particular parameter sets. Uh, this is what's called, a, it's re-weighting from 
not a single mix, uh, distribution, but the mixture distribution of all the data I've collected so far. So you're essentially going in and picking up, I just say, hey, here's all my data at all the parameter sets. This is a formula for figuring out how probable would a given sample be in the parameter set I care about now. Questions on this? This is, this is important to understand what's going on, so you, yeah. So it, my impression, the way you described it, is that it would be pretty strictly interpolative. In other words, you'd have a trust radius. Mm -hmm. and you could extrapolate a short distance around the trust radius. Yes. But really, the way you're going to use this in practice is like a fairly wide-spaced gridding of, of parameter sets, and then you'll be trying to interpolate to the right. Right. So I, I think there's a couple different ways that we could use it. Ideally, the way we'll use it is we start in a region, start wandering around, and when we exit the trust radius, say, I'm gonna carry out another simulation here. And now my trust area is this. And I keep going, expanding that trust radius. You know, and, and what I'll do, now, whether it's the optimization or whether it's, uh, you know, let's think about it in terms of Bayesian inference, that my probability is gonna pile up at the edge. And it's saying, you know, I, I really need to go further that way. Let's, let's keep expanding the trust radius by carrying out more simulations. So let me give uh, an example of this. So, uh, so what I have here is what the, uh, the level plots, are. So, so what we have here is two a plot of root mean square deviation of um, saturated uh, liquid density from a vapor liquid equilibrium simulation. Uh, so this is data coming uh, from a collaboration with Rich Messerly, who's a very talented NRC postdoc at NIST, who, I think is, is listening on, uh, on, on, on uh, Zoom right now since he couldn't come because of the shutdown. Uh, and what you see in red lines are direct simulations. You carry out a, you know, about 400 direct simulations and interpolate between them. Uh, and then uh, what I have in the, uh, ignore the, the bluish line, but the green line is doing M bar from a single reference point. What you see is that if you're close in parameters in sigma and epsilon, uh, it, it gives you almost the same RMSD as the simulations. If we then include a set of M bar simulations at a single epsilon, but um, a series of sigma, because it turns out that the parameters are much more sensitive to sigma, then uh, we can reconstruct what the properties are and then compute the deviations of that uh, with the dotted blue line. And you can see the dotted blue lines uh, lie almost exactly along the, um, along the, uh, the red lines, the direct simulation lines. Uh, finish the thought. Then. Um, and so uh, in this case, you know, this, uh, a relatively small number of simulations enables us to get uh, results that are almost good as good as the direct simulation because a lot of those direct simulations we're simulating the same configurations that we had already simulated. Okay. I think the multiple state reweighting is a um, is really is really awesome. And I um, and I have a I have a little question about um, um, about how fast the memory and computational cost grows with the number of states because in my because in my uh, in my experience, using um, um, using using M bar and fitting to mm -hmm. say multiple temperatures and pressures, yeah. that the size of the matrix grows as the square of the number of states. It does. And I wasn't sure how the computational cost grew because you have to converge these relative free energies of states. Yes. So that's a good question. It, the, the scaling is not fantastic with large numbers of states. Um, however, we've got it. You know, playing around with it depending on the number of samples you have. And we're assuming most of these cases, maybe we only have a few thousand samples. We can scale up to hundreds of states and have it run pretty fast. Um, but uh, and, and then there's also two parts. One part is the, uh, there's, there's two types of states that you care about. There's states you've collected data at. And that actually scales with the number of states. That scales n squared. That goes badly. But then you have the, the states I want to get information out at. If I want to get data at, you know, 3,000 states. That scales linearly. And so um, in most cases, what we're hoping is we're never running, you know, we're not in, run it, including hundreds of simulations at hundreds of different data points. We're including simulations at dozens of data points, and then we're predicting at larger numbers. And I suppose you don't always have to include the states that are, you don't have to include the states that are very far away from where you want to estimate. So good question. It turns out that mathematically, 
yes, you have to. The, the, you can always leave out states that, that are early on in the yes. organization. Yes, if you know, if you know like they're not involved, you can, you can leave them out. Like, yeah. uh, Quasi-Newton method yeah. can only use the last L simulation. Yes, 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 exactly. Right. So these, are, these are good questions. Yeah, this is, so this is, yeah, they're, they're good to get into because this is a idea that's complex to get into but much more straightforward once you've entirely grokked what's going on. So it's worth spending the time on that. I have a question about, you said that the probability is going to pile up and then you'll know which, where you need to simulate more. Could you explain that? I'm sorry, I was just saying that you know, if, if, you, if you have some sort of algorithm, you have a trust region, you are going to have an algorithm, it's driving towards the edge of the trust region. At some point, it's going to say, I want to leave the trust region. You're going to run another simulation there so you can keep expanding the trust region. Okay. That's okay. all I meant. Thanks. If it was Bayesian, you'd visualize that as your, your maximum of probability would be near the edge of your trust region. Okay, um, so this, this works pretty well. Now, the issue is, uh, if you're doing two, three, four-dimensional scans, this works well. The problem is, is if you're doing a highly multi-dimensional scan, if you're trying to optimize all of your Leonard Jones parameters at once, then you start getting uh, a lot of data there. So, oh, sorry, trust regions. I, I mentioned this as well. We can detect where re rating fails. We have pretty good, um, we're still working out on, on all of the theory on this, but we have good heuristics to know when MBAR fails. And that is, comes down to the number of effective samples. Fundamentally, when you're calculating expectation, what you're doing is you collected a lot of data and you have weights depending, that would says how likely are you to have observed that simulation in your new parameter set. Uh, but there's a failure mode. You never get the weights to go to zero. The weights have to equal one. So what happens is if you have no samples that look anything like uh, samples you'd collect from a simulation at state i, uh, they'll all, it'll, it'll pile all the weight into the simulation that looks most like it. Uh, there's only, it'll say there's only one sample that you have from state i, but usually that's a pathology. It's not you have one simulation from state i. You have all of the weight into the sample that looks the most like simulations from state I. And if that happens, you have very poor configuration space overlap. However, what you can do is take the weights and say, about how many samples do I have? If all the weight is in one sample, you have about one sample, which is not very good for computing averages. If your weights are completely evenly spread out, you have N samples. So a uh, Kish's estimator of number of effective samples, uh, this is for normalized uh, weights, uh, ends up working pretty well, uh, very well as a heuristic. So where the weight is just the Boltzmann probability in state I divided by the sum of the Boltzmann probability of that configuration from all of the other states. And uh, what we found is over a large number of predicted observables, if the number of affected samples is over 50, our error estimates are not good. Uh, if it, are good if it's over 50. If it's under 50, the error estimates are not good. So you have sort of a two-part um, uh, trust interval. If your estimated uncertainty is too large, then you know you can't trust it anymore. If your number of effective samples is too large, you can't trust the error estimate. So it's the it's the minimum of the two. If you're at a point that you know fails either of those, then you can't really trust the estimates outside of that. So um, so if here's an example. So this is uh, data from looking at uh, the meet potential. So meet potential is is used a lot in uh, alkane simulations, we have a large uh, range of temperatures and pressures. So it's just like Leonard Jones, except that you have a free parameter. Uh, instead of a 12, it could be some other number. Um, and so what we've done here is, uh, here we've got uh, simulations in epsilon, ah, epsilon, sigma, no, there we go, epsilon, sigma, and lambda. And what I have is, as you go away, from our initial sample point X in, uh, so the, the, the level curves are the number of effective samples. So as you get further away from epsilon and sigma, you can see that the number of effect, and as you get farther away in lambda, that's expressed by color, you get further off. If you're very close at the same lambda, then you've got 400 effective samples. Essentially, 40% of your samples look just the same as if you've been running with a different sigma and epsilon. As you get further out, uh, then in, in, in this case, in epsilon, you can go a lot further in epsilon than in sigma. Uh, then the number of effective samples starts to drop. And at a certain point, you see these shapes instead of being these nice ovals, which express you know, sort of the, 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 the nice, smooth dependent difference of properties. Uh, they start getting all wacky shaped. And if, you, if you're going to a lambda that's a much stiffer uh, inner core, then you've got like five or six effective samples. Um, 
from, from the total simulation. So the uh, number of accepted samples seems to be a very good heuristic to use for your trust region for this. Questions on that? Um, okay, I'll go on. Okay, so with these fast models, we can use the full machine or Bayesian inference. So if you have a relatively small number of parameters, it turns out you can do some tricky math. And you, if you calculate a couple of things, essentially if you calculate these numbers, uh, these basis fun these you can treat these as basis functions, and you can calculate the energy at any parameter, having just tabulated a, you know, five or six numbers from each simulation. Uh, so I won't get into that because in general that won't work for us, but it's a nice trick for simple systems And what you can do is then essentially you run a few simulations and you know your probability everywhere uh, You can do Bayesian inference and uh, in this case here. I'm using uh, this is again a data from uh, the paper that, 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 that Rich led FN using mean potential fit to phase equilibrium data here. We're using mean potential again What you can do is uh, given a set of data uh, for phase uh, uh, phase uh, equilibrium behavior, uh, you we've got um, we use Markov chain Monte Carlo to sample the posterior of the probability of aphane models as a function of these three parameters: two two continuous parameters and one integer parameter. So you've got you know the visitation for each of these uh, models, uh, and uh, we can turn those into base factors. We can say of a, a given data set, what lambda does it support? In this case, it turns out that there's two different uh, for your uh, that there's two different um, um, parameters that are that are equally well weighted. The data doesn't allow us to distinguish between the um, between the model. The model is just as good as describing both of those um, both of those models are equally good at describing the experimental data, and others are not. And I think this is sort of a, a microcosm of of the way we want to approach a lot of these parameterization problems and these choice of model problems. Uh, sample the posterior in the model space and use these sorts of statistical informations to make quantitative decisions about which models work and which models don't. For the people uh, online, you do. Yeah. Okay, so um, when when your lambda parameter gets as high as eighteen, mm -hmm. um, what happens with the with the thermodynamic, like the energy conservation in these simulations? Because it, it becomes one of these like hard wall potentials. You have to take really small time steps, or the thing just slams against it. Um, but it's not a problem. The, the time steps are such that it's yeah. It, they, Rich was careful on this, so yeah. Um, anyway, so so that questions on the overall because this gives you a sense of. Most of, I haven't talked too much about surrogate models because in this case I could get away without using surrogate models and just use MBAR. But the questions about the process so far. Again, this is not the way it is going to be exactly in the OpenMM property calculator infrastructure, but it, it, it's a good walkthrough of, of being actually used to, to answer these questions. Um, okay, so even cheaper, using a surrogate model or a meta model. So if we're dealing with high dimensional spaces, even MBAR, to, to, to really uh, get good coverage of the space, MBAR isn't going to be enough. You need to evaluate the energies at thousands of different parameters, and that does start to get slow. We've generally found that running MBAR, the, 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 the process of generate trajectory, reevaluate the energies at several different parameters, is maybe a thousand times faster. So once you have to evaluate a thousand points, then it starts being the same cost as, as your simulations themselves. So, uh, I mean, to do a thousand times more, but it starts taking up a larger and larger percentage of space. So what we want to be doing is use some sort of model for the free energy. You notice that a lot of these cases that are likely, we had very nice oval shapes, which indicates nice linear responses, nice smooth responses in terms of parameters as the, as the uh, from, uh, properties as the parameters change. So you know, here's you know, a, a look at something else that's done in our group using this approach, looking at the hydration free energy of a Leonard Jones sphere in tip 3P water. What you see is that these properties are generally relatively smoothly varying. As long as you don't cross a phase boundary, they don't change that much for parameter parameter. These are smooth functions. We have to do a lot of work to get those smooth functions. They're not obvious smooth functions, but they're relatively smooth functions. And so what we want to do is replace the smooth function of property as a function of parameter uh, from calculations by some multidimensional fitting within, that includes proper ranges of uncertainties. 
So what we started working with is Gaussian processes, looking at other options for higher dimensions, polynomial chaos expansion, you know, neural nets, other machine learning. There's a lot of different options here that we really haven't explored. Um, and criteria, the thing is, we have smooth functions. They're not, we want to be careful that we don't want to overfit, like the property, the, the density is a function of sigma does not suddenly take an upturn right at the edge just because we have a little blip in our data there. It's probably uncertainty. They're going to be smooth, uh, and we almost always have good local data because if we're at a lo locally, we can collect the M bar, uh, we, we can get the estimates using M bar uh, with high precision. The further away it is, the, the worse it is. So we, we have smooth data and we have good local information. How can we best use that into statistical learning? Yeah, we don't know. That's, a, that's an area of investigation. Um, so here, there's, we don't have as much data here. Uh, here's an example where uh, we're taking cyclohexane. It has four Leonard, four Leonard Jones parameters. And here's an example of doing Monte Carlo sampling on the posterior, just looking at, I can't remember if this is just density, if this is density and heat of vaporization. I think it's density and heat of vaporization. And so we've, we we're sampling four dimensions. We can't really look at the surfaces, but we can draw the marginals. You see that something, the hydrogen parameters are much less constrained by the data than the carbon parameters are, which is, you'd expect that because they're being, you know, they're smaller and they're being dragged along by the carbon parameters. But all these covariances, uh, we, we can get out of this. And, you know, maybe start exploiting this information a little bit, you know, which parameters uh, are covariant with each other. Um, so that's, that's sort of the approach that we want to use. Uh, the scaling, we know it works well for lower dimensions. The scaling, we're not sure uh, how well it works. So how does it scale with number of parameters? Gaussian process may only scale to 10 to 15 dimensions, investigating other options. Um, we probably want to be looking at optimizing in parameter eigenspaces, you know, learn how parameters are coupled. Many sets of parameters have low correlations together. If things are highly correlated, do we want to, you know, optimize rather than optimizing every single carbon independently, do we want to optimize, say, a carbon and then a carbon deviation parameter depending on what its neighbors are as told by SMIRCs? You know, we, we can decompose this into a lower dimensional manifold and optimize on that rather than optimizing every parameter independently. There's, there's natural torsions, with, there's natural coordinates within the parameter set in the same way as there's natural coordinates within coordinate sets. So, so we want to take advantage of that. That'll take some thinking. Um, properties are generally smooth functions, properties, we, we, we want to be able to take advantage of that. Uh, maybe we need to collect relatively little data locally because in most cases it's a linear response. Uh, just, or, or, you know, if we just have single pairwise correlations, we can get everything. Different ways we can accelerate things. Um, this is for Leonard Jones, we can use for bond charge corrections, uh, valence terms as well even, um, different functional forms using ideas like reversible jump Monte Carlo to build evidence for different forms. I don't have any slides on that now. We've started playing around with it, but there's some great uh, data that, from what Josh was using, jumping between different um, uh, atom, numbers of atom types. And so we use the same thing here to jump between different, uh, different functional forms. Uh, let me, yeah. Particular things, choice of combining rules, functional forms, atom types we've talked before. We want to automate that. We build an atom calculator API to make it easily swappable for property and easily optimized. That will take, uh, conceptually it's straightforward, actually getting it to work and, and being, air, you know, being robust is, will be hard. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but if, uh, but if proper, but if our finding, if we find that properties are generally smooth functions of mm -hmm. parameters, does that mean that our model distributions of like, of, uh, of like, does, does that mean like our, our distributions of parameter probabilities is well modeled by a Gaussian? Uh, so if it's linear and we're using the, the, the Gaussian uh, likelihood model for, for, for the data, that they, the, the error is uh, normally distributed. Uh, so it, it, normally distributed means if, if it's linear, if it's a linear response. If it's a nonlinear response, it'll stop being Gaussian. So we, we know there's cases where Yes, it, it behaves nice and linear, but it's smooth, but it like starts curving after a while. So, so, but I would not be surprised if we can take advantage of the fact that locally it's going to look Gaussian and they'll just be gradually changing Gaussians as we move along. I mean, you have a better sense for how smooth these parameters <laughs> are than we do right? with force balance. That's what you're, you're already getting that information out. So we, we should talk about it and figure out how to take advantage of, of what you've learned in force balance and, and, uh, and incorporate that to, to optimize how we move to these spaces. Uh, yeah.
so benchmarks discussed from, from yesterday. So that's the end of the how we're going to try to speed these up. There's a lot of research work to do there, but I think there's hopefully it, it, it seems to us that there's going to be a, a lot of routes for really speeding these things up since so we actually can use lots of condensed phase data, optimize many parameters at the same time. One thing you might look at is um, if you take the second derivative mm -hmm. of um, an interaction, let's say a dimer interaction mm -hmm. between two of the atoms and the different molecules, mm -hmm. you can get that directly reports, if you take it as a function of distance, for example, mm -hmm. that those derivatives annihilate all terms in the force field except for that particular interaction. Mm -hmm. So you can tease out a non-bond force constant, um, charges, et cetera, mm -hmm. from that, and it might give additional information on the parameters, either to start with or to compare. To their, their yeah, yeah, I, I guess one question is how much you have collect, you know, how much those, even if it's pairwise, the statistical mechanics stops being pairwise. I'm wondering, did, yeah, so that's a good thing to think about. This wouldn't be parallel, but you can yeah. get it out of the, You're doing quantum calculations anyway. Mm -hmm. You're getting the second derivatives. Mm -hmm. You have a dimer system, and you happen to be doing those. Yeah. And in a monomer system, if you do the same thing, if you transform to internals, for example, mm -hmm. the second derivative of the energy with respect to the bond teases out just the bond interaction. Mm -hmm. And likewise for all the other interactions. Right, so, so I guess and I, this, this could be too simplistic a way to think about it, is that there's a lot of cancellation of errors of quantum. I don't know that we do want to match exactly to the pair things. We want to match to the Gibbs free energy. And certainly there's a close correspondence, but I wonder if that's overfitting. And, and if, if we go to the bulk, it could be that there's not enough information from these bulk simulations to completely constrain the free energy. In that case, we would need to start looking at some of those interactions as well. The problem is, of course, their gas phase calculation. Right, yeah. Yeah, and I think that's the sort of thing that might fit well into benchmarks is that, hey, we're going to fit to this data, but it better not screw up too badly this other information because we know that physics constrains that to be up to polarization changes that has to be matched as well. Um, so, yeah, so each generation of force will be evaluated using benchmarks with decreasing coverage. Benchmarks will be publicly posted. The benchmarks, this is why this fits in here, the benchmarks will be run with a property calculator framework, in you know, which you can, you can upload and run those using the same framework. Uh, other big things in the benchmarks, using some reserves testing set from training sets, I think is a good idea. But then we also want to benchmark against things that are not in the training set, different properties. Um, binding for energies, small molecule crystal structures, liquid structure factors, phase change data. Uh, I, think, I thought I put this in here at some point, but um, uh, um, other things like viscosities, self-diffusion coefficients, things that we don't necessarily want to parameterize too, but there'll be nice checks to see that we're not getting the physics fundamentally wrong. Um, and I think for the particular benchmarks to use and the data sets to use, definitely want to continue conversations, particularly in the data sets and the benchmarks things. We, we're, we're zeroing in on what we want to do, but I think there's still a lot of uh, details to, to be worked out as we, as we move, especially into you know, year two. I don't know if this, I think the math of this is, sort of, is intriguing. I mean, basically, if you, let's say you're trying to optimize 100 parameters, yes. but you can do these Gaussian things on, let's say, mm. 10 at a time. Yes. And you're getting essentially, you know, medium dimensional marginals yes. of the full Bayesian yes. distribution, yes. or at least some approximation of that. Yes. And so, I mean, that, and I don't know whether you can sort of have overlapping sets of marginals that would be useful. Yes, exactly. So, so I think understanding essentially the, the mutual covariance of all the data exactly. will help us drastically reduce the dimensionality of the fits we have to do. Right. And I guess it seems like there's two flavors of coupling one of them is the kinds of things you've shown where mm. you have sigma and epsilon for one atom highly type. couple yes but then you've got sigma for one atom type and sigma for another atom mm -hmm. type and those are only going to couple to the extent that they show up in the same data i guess uh right? i i need to think about that in more same, but in the same measurement like yes if, yes if for ethanol i only have mm -hmm. if, if for ethanol oxygen that type of oxygen i only have the th if my ethanol oxygens 
never see an acetamide nitrogen yeah. in any experimental data, then they can be optimized separately. Probably, I think there, there must be some correlation through there because the, there's some correlation that feeds through, through the data types. itself. They go yeah. through other types. Yeah. Right. But, they're, but yeah, they'll can you identify weak carbon. couples? What's it? They'll propagate through carbon. You're right. It will prop you're absolutely right. Yeah. But there will be stronger and weaker couplings, which we might be able to learn and benefit from. Right. So the great thing is, is once we feel that our surrogate models are well fit, to you know Whatever the data we can we can do all, you know, all this stuff can be done it's it's very fast to do these analyses well and if once you get to 100 dimensions they're not very fast but they're they're sure a heck of a lot better than running molecular simulations thanks all right i think that's that's the last slide i have on on, on this